days ago that I think the next Libertarian National Convention, we need snipers in the back of the room to keep anybody from stripping and getting up on stage. Well, that seems like a violation of the NAP. Well, they started it. <laughs> it's just <justified. laughs> you, you, you sure I'm okay war. with violating the NAP against other Libertarians. If I have to see man boobs I yes. and an Iron Cross tattooed on your shoulder, right. then that, that is a violation of my non-aggression principle. So, it's, it's just horrible. But, yeah, we've got – I mean, our – our shows are are easily. Last night, our episode was over a reach of ten thousand people within the first three hours on our video cast, uh, and we talked about everything from how how this guy went from being the janitor of the local county courthouse to spend the last twenty two years as a state representative, and then we went line by line through the issues that are going through the general assembly. Uh, long form. Our shows are usually an hour and fifteen, hour and a half, uh, and then today we we mix it up and we try to keep it entertaining. And we interviewed Robin Miller for an hour. All right, cool. So you're listening to We Are Libertarians. Uh, we just went live on Facebook because we're going to talk about the Parkland shooting. Uh, you're joining the program in progress. I'm here with the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast. That's Jeremiah Morrill. That's Danny Morrill. That's Dakota Davis and Creighton Harrington. Uh, please don't hide. Uh, please be seen. So, yes, we are uh, going to talk a little bit about what happened in Parkland, Florida. Now, as a rule of thumb, I don't know if you guys, you guys are new here. Danny's never been on the show. I never mention the shooter's name. I don't believe yeah. in giving them that press. I believe that these people are mentally ill but also seeking attention, and I don't want to give them attention. So if you could refrain from using their name, that'd be I don't great. Those names I, I think that's a great philosophy to have. I've, yeah. I've, I've thought that for a long time. Yeah, because I think you, the, the theory of copycat crime is real. So, uh, so just a little bit of hap what happened. This is what happened uh, near Miami. This is from sunsentinel.com. Uh, from a story called, Accused Florida Shooter Confesses He Headed to Subway, Then McDonald's After Massacre. Accused Parkland uh, School Shooter, uh, Mr. Uh, Criminal, admitted his guilt to detectives, saying he discarded his AR-15 rifle and ammunition magazines at the scene and escaped by blending into the crowd of fleeing students, according to arrest reports. After slipping away, he went to Subway inside a nearby Walmart for a drink, then headed to McDonald's before he was arrested without incident, by an officer who recognized his description. He arrived on campus Wednesday at 2.19 p.m. in an Uber, whose driver has since spoken with detectives. As he walked through the school, shooting students, teacher, and staff, he fired well over 100 shots, according to law enforcement. Cruz stated that he was the gunman who entered the school campus armed with an AR-15 and began shooting students that he saw in the hallways and on school grounds, states a report from the Broward County Sheriff. They say Cruz stated that he brought additional loaded web magazines to school and kept them hidden in a backpack until he got on campus. Um, it was legally purchased in Broward County. Cruz bought the AR-15 rifle, allegedly used in the shootings at the Sunrise Tactical Supply in a strip mall in Coral Springs. At the store Thursday afternoon, a closed sign was on the door and agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives were inside. Uh, the special agent in charge of the ATF investigation uh, said because he's over the age of 18, he can legally purchase an AR-15. The arrest report said he bought it last year, but once you hit your 18th birthday, you can legally buy a rifle. And if you pass the background check, once you hit your 21st birthday, you can buy a handgun. Some of the restrictions on gun purchases include if someone has been formally adjudicated mentally defective by a court. One loophole is if a person voluntarily seeks mental health treatment and a measure designed to encourage people to seek help. Illegal immigrants are also barred from purchasing guns. He was ticking none of those boxes. Now, this uh, is similar to many of the shootings that we've had in recent, in recent months. Uh, you, the Texas church shooter, he was a former veteran, and he was legally allowed to buy a gun because the Air Force didn't actually mark that he was um, d discharged for uh, domestic violence, and so he shouldn't have been able to get a gun. Uh, the Vegas shooter was, let's be honest, probably a gun dealer, but <laughs> we'll talk about that in like a conspiracy episode or something. So his mental health is really what's at issue, and the suspect's defense attorney says he shows sign of autism and appears to be suffering from mental illness. Uh, we have a strong belief, they said, that his mental illness will be a significant issue in the case and a significant issue in how he got to this point. Uh, worsening his mental issues were the trauma last November of his adopted mother's death, he said. He was trying to get her to go to that Ill to get that illness checked out, but it moved very quickly and she passed away quite suddenly. He was just lost after that. He was sad and he was discouraged. Uh, he had a white supremacist connection. Detectives are investigating a possible connection between a small Florida-based uh, white supremacist group called the Republic of Florida, 
which see, seeks a white, white ethno state. Uh, many people on social media are making a big deal out of this, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a lot of the, the basic details. Uh, Trump, Rick Scott said Thursday he planned to meet with the legislative leaders next week to discuss bills to make schools safe and keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. Uh, and, yeah, it's just a very tragic situation. It's obviously something that nobody wants to see happen, and, you know, it is... I don't know that... Uh, does it seem like these incidents are becoming more and more common, or are we just reporting on I, these more and more? They're yeah. not happening more, but they are more deadly than past mass shootings. Right. Okay. So Stati- statistically, they're not happening more. We're as we talk, we're we're right at six weeks into the new year, and there's a an infographic that somebody put together claiming that there were 18 school shootings so far this year, which I think has been proven to be there, false. There have it's almost been like incidents or discharges of weapons on school grounds. Yeah, there have been up until now three people killed in school shootings at two incidents, but there's been 18 different schools where there have been shootings, meaning guns went off. But the media has twisted that to you know. To, kind of, to, to further a narrative, a certain anti-gun narrative. Right. Is it because of – so, I listen, I'm not a gun person. I've never fired a gun. Uh, I know you guys have living in east-central Indiana, more of a rural area. What is an AR-15? Explain so what that is. An AR-15 is, is basically um, – I'm glad you brought this up because everybody thinks of the AR-15 as um, a scary – military type uh, basically what what the media likes to call the an assault weapon um an an AR15 looks more killy than mm-hmm. any other rifle it looks like a military rifle and yeah, in, in it, fact it's the semi-automatic well it's not actually the semi-automatic version of the standard issue correct uh military one but it looks a lot like it okay um, right so they they come in uh basically they come in in different uh sizes so you have like a uh, the majority of AR-15s that can shoot a 223 or a 556 round, they can uh, shoot either or. But of course, you can have modified barrels to where they shoot either either one of those rounds. Um, it, it's it's not much different than a standard rifle. And I'll be monitoring the comments on the Facebook Live on our main page, so uh, feel free to comment there. If we miss anything, I'd love to have you guys participate on the Facebook Live. Um, obviously, a lot of people know a lot about weapons and have a lot to say about the, right. part, the, the discussion that's going on right now. So please one, feel free to jump in. One thing that I, that I do want to mention uh, that, you, that you brought up uh, whenever you were reading through, uh, reading through your notes um, was the autism. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm really gl- glad that you brought that up because it's, uh, it, it's, it's rather interesting the way that, uh, that this particular shooter actually went about his uh you know after after he finished the deed um he he went to the subway he he escaped the grounds uh by blending in with the people that's that's not something that's common of someone who commits a mass shooting especially of 17 people usually they either try to commit suicide they have they they plan on committing suicide by cop there's there's another it's very way uncommon that they've got a guy yeah. arrested at the end of the story it's very disconnected oh, yeah. it's a very disconnected act where you go to you're disconnected from your emotions you're disconnected from what just happened it's a very odd behavior yeah yeah I, and that's a, that's one of the things that really stuck out to me um, the most is that the the psychology behind this person and now that you mentioned uh, that his that uh, the attorney mentioned autism that that makes a lot of sense to me in in my mind and what and what my limited knowledge is on on psychological illnesses right uh, what are your thoughts Creighton on on the just the weaponry I mean because guns are really at the center of what everybody right. is saying well an AR-15 is n- technically it's no different than uh, as far as like what bullets go in and what how fast they come out and how much damage they can do they're no different than a hunting rifle right um the difference is that ar-15s tend to be more modular that's sort of like one of the main reasons they're popular is you can change the stock you can change the the grip you can add scopes easier you can do stuff to it a lot quicker than you could with a hunting rifle that's got like a wood stock i mean i mean you can do it to those things but a lot one of the reasons ar-15 is more popular is because of that um but as far as like whether or not it's some fancy firearm that is more 
more able to kill people than a hunting rifle it's not i mean you can get a big magazine for a hunting rifle you can get a you can get all of the various uh eccentricities that the media likes to say about ar-15s for any hand, for any rifle really unless it's like a single shot like side load or something from like the 20s right but like it, the 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 reason they don't like it is because it looks like a military rifle. It looks like they watch they watched Black Hawk down, and it looks like the same firearm. But that it essentially is like I mean it's it's a ga- they're both gas operated firearms. One is fully automatic or can fire in bursts. One is a civilian issue essentially, which is AR stands for Armalite, not assault rifle, but right. it is made to uh, be light. It's made to have a higher capacity uh, in the magazine. And you can customize it more so. But they are, in theory, I mean, they're they're much more convenient to carry and to use for terror than a Remington 700 30-odd right. 6. They're more convenient it, to use for anything that explain, you're using Explain, explain for, what though. that gun is, please. It's, it's a bolt-action hunting rifle that's right. been around since 1959, probably. And it holds three to five rounds in the... Uh, the magazine. So when go ahead, Jer. You can get a scary looking twenty two as well. I mean, it's right. You know the the psychology <laughs> of it. Yeah, you can have one that looks you know to the to the untrained eye, an AR could look less it could look less harmful than than a tricked out twenty two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, which is the small you know a very small ca- caliper. Yeah, a, a small caliber, small load. A, a varmint rifle like yeah, what you squirrel use to hunt squirrel. Yeah, and, and it, raccoon. An AR-15 shoots the same diameter round as a 22 rifle. It's .223 inches of mm-hmm. one inch. A 22 caliber rifle is .22, so it's the same diameter, just moves faster, and there's a little more mass behind behind it. Okay. So, so when people, and again, feel free to comment in the in the Facebook Live video. We'd we'd love to hear your questions. If you have questions about any of this, uh, guns, gun rights, gun uh, banning guns. The discussion that's going on, we'd love to hear it, uh, and feel free to write us if you listen at a later date. But- One thing I think, just on the since we're in case we're moving on from the actual gun itself, uh, it's not uh, AR-15s. In fact, no standard issue civilian weapon is fully automatic or or burst or or is there nor is there a burst. Yeah, you've got to have a special a, permit. Right, you have to have a federal a- firearms permit in order to own an automatic weapon of any kind in yeah. the United States, which is incredibly difficult, very expensive. Um, so if you wanted to walk into your corner gun shop and buy yeah. a fully automatic weapon, you're going to walk away empty-handed because you can't. Right. It, it and, takes a tremendous amount of background checks to buy a fully automatic weapon. Uh, it it's takes been that sever- way for a long time. Since the uh, it's since, since the, the Tommy, 90s. The to- since Tommy the, guns, yeah. The Tommy guns, essentially. 30s or something yeah. like that. And then they I put, guess there was a ban in the Clinton. Uh, there was the Brady, Brady, the Brady Bill, Bill yeah. Yeah, and the Brady Bill put further restrictions on it, but it was illegal with the Tommy gun during the, uh, the 30s. The 30s. Um, so... Do you guys so would you say that this is a weapon of war and if so do you do you think it should be banned? No. Absolutely not. No. So uh, do I think it's a, no for me dog. Do do I think it's a weapon of war? I mean that's that's sort of a loaded question. Sure. Any weapon is a weapon of war. I mean whether or not it's more effective at killing people is dependent on a number of things, yep. you know. I could you could probably find somebody who could take a hunting rifle and kill, you know, 20 people with it before somebody could kill three with a saw rifle because they're better trained. I mean, right. and that's that's the thing that you have to, uh, just like you said, it's a loaded question. With every single weapon that has ever been introduced in the history of mankind, it is made, like its specific purpose is to make something or someone dead it, like, to kill yeah, flesh yeah that is a, that is its sole purpose yeah. if um, if you buy you want to if you want to hurt shoot somebody but not kill them i mean you're b- talking about like beanbag guns or something yeah, right like you're not talking about a full-fledged actual these fire. are we're all, we're talking about symptoms instead of causation right. you know these are all just implements we're bit we're, we're complaining about you know the forks and knives it's a tool that you're using to, to accomplish that right. task. If we take away guns, you're going to go to cars, you're going to go to knives, right. you're going to go and, to and other, the reason, other the violent reason, acts. The reason people bring up guns is, I, okay, there's probably a, an infinite number of reasons, but one of the reasons that I think is most prominent is, especially by people who have never been around them, they've never fired one, they've never lived with people who fired them, the only people they've ever seen with firearms have been cops. Like, these kinds of people, they just say that if we got rid of guns, then 
you know, it would be better because even if they tried to kill, shoot up a school, they couldn't. They, you can't stab 17 kids to death in a school, which, you know, that's debatable. You can. But, I mean, the, uh, deadliest, the deadliest school massacre was a bomb. Right. In, like, what, that, in early, late night, 1800s 20s or, or 20s, 20s or, it was, or something that killed, yeah. like, yeah, a whole school blew it up. Yeah. But the the thing is, is preventing – okay, so there's there's two issues here. One is – Let's say, hypothetically, that tomorrow Congress passed and the President signed a outright prohibition of all firearms of any kind. So what's, what's the first thing that happens? Well, one, how are you going to get rid of the 330-plus million guns that are already estimated already in private hands? It, it's more than that. I mean, there, there have been surveys where uh, people – basically polling says that 39% of households in America have guns. And 42% of the people claim that they have weapons. And so you've got most of the country, uh, you've got ha almost half the country that has weapons. You have more guns than people. The idea that, and when you see the discussions about we need to ban the AR, well, most gun deaths are by pistols. Yep. Most people kill themselves with pistols. And most gun deaths are suicides, When you too. have three quarters of the gun deaths in this country are suicides. The next are gang violence around the drug war. The next uh, level is 1,900 deaths around uh, domestic violence, and then mass shootings like this at schools are it's, so fraction are such right. a small fraction of the percentage of gun violence in a, in the country that it's it's statistically negligible. But they yeah, are but that, the they, they are the easiest to manipulate the public conversation against guns to completely outlaw guns, and it's not gun control advocates; it's gun confiscation advocates. That's right. what they're really after. Exactly. And they're just the. That's why you see Japan. They're smart their, enough to and, piecemeal it. And Australia and those. You see them used as a statistic because they're the nations that have. Right, and that's that's an yeah. entirely different conversation we need to get into, which is comparison is bad statistical comparisons between the United States and other countries. Oh, but yeah. yes, the the and and that's what frankly I find infuriating about um, specifically after Sandy Hook. Um, Sandy Hook was probably the most powerful push by gun control advocates that actually got somewhere and almost passed. I mean, it only didn't pass because Mike Lee from Utah pretty much by himself prevented it from passing. Right. Um, and that would have been uh, a substantial gun control measure that would have passed since the Brady Bill. Um, but the thing is, is the what was in that law was mostly like universal background checks and like the specifics of like how to implement it but nothing in that law would have prevented anything that happened at Sandy Hook and in fact all of that they wanted to have in that law was already on the books in Connecticut as a state law right and it didn't prevent the shooting from happening and and that's that's the problem with these things is that People think that it, it, it's it's just it gun mass shootings are the most significant example of the do something caucus running amok. Right, it's something bad happens. We need to do something. Doesn't matter if it works or not. It needs to. We just have to feel better because we did something about it. Right, and government and, has to be the solution. This yeah, is, government we have has this, to be the solution. Dakota yeah. and I talk about this constantly on our show, where it's you know whether it's a this week it's been somebody's ditch is flooding and their county road is you know a farm field is flooding it's coming across the road and they want the government to solve that problem for them they yep. want to get involved it's the same emotional view of yep. i want government to solve this for me right. and it's not a solvable problem the, through the, legislation the, that's and that's that's probably the most important thing to note about all this and you'll you'll watch the pundit from both sides um celebrities trump sean hannity chelsea handler whoever they're all going to go out there and they're going to say this is what we need to do, this needs to happen, and this will fix the problem. And that's bullcrap. Absolutely nobody, nobody on either side knows what to do. Right. No one. There is no easy solution to this. And, frankly, you're trying to prevent random acts of violence. Randomness. Not, not, not pre, I mean, this was premeditated, but I'm talking like, you know, when you have gang violence, you can expect there to be homicides by gun. If you have domestic violence, you can expect there to be homicides with firearm. But when it comes to like random acts of violence, like school shootings, that are such a small percentage of gun violence, um, you know, you're you're basically trying to prevent random aberrations from happening with the law. And that's, I mean, that's 
just impossible. Like it's it is by definition a random act. So let me let me read this. This is from uh, a young Americans for Liberty guy named Rocco Lucente, and I shared this on the We Are Libertarians Facebook page. Um, and and it's real short, but I think he really illustrates a, a smart point. He writes, the FBI couldn't be bothered to do anything about the Sarnev brothers before the bombing of the Boston Marathon, but they had plenty of time and resources to burn innocent children alive at Waco. The FBI couldn't be bothered to do anything about the Pulse nightclub shooter in Orlando, but they had plenty of time and resources to gun down Lavoy Finicum as he tried to leave the building he was occupying. The FBI couldn't be bothered to track down this shooter, but they had plenty of time and resources to conspire against the then-candidate Donald Trump by breaking numerous laws to obtain a FISA warrant under false pretenses to spy on his campaign. Are these people supposed to protect and serve you, or are they government's personal hit squad of domestic terrorists? That is the question every conservative, and I would say libertarian, should be asking themselves about the FBI. And so what buried in this, in this point is that by taking away guns, by taking away self-defense and the entire notion of self-defense, you're putting it into the hands of government. And government couldn't stop this. The FBI was notified about this guy. He left a YouTube comment under his full name, and the FBI said, well, we did some database searching, and we couldn't quite track him down, and we, didn't, we just couldn't figure everything out. The guy's full freaking name is used in the YouTube comment. The guy was known by the police. The mother would call the police and say, uh, I need help with him. Can you come talk to him? The local police didn't do anything. The school had just ex expelled him and told him he couldn't bring backpacks before that because of his constant social media postings about how much he loved guns. In that YouTube comment was, I wanna, I'm want i an aspiring school shooter. Like he, he was broadcasting to the world what he was going to do. The yep. FBI in Miami, the local police the school, these government agencies all know, knew this guy. He was a known quantity to them, and they didn't protect these children. And so when you want to talk about how uh, we need to get rid of guns, which is an absolute fantasy, as we just said, you're never going – it's just not practical. It's, Let's it's, say we passed a law. We gave gun confiscation advocates everything that they wanted. You couldn't take all of the guns in this country without some sort of – further tragedy yeah and a you, civil war happening yeah you want to talk about violence right against other people try and walk up to gun owners in this country and say we're taking your guns whether you want it or not right meanwhile you're you're asking us to put our trust and our safety into the hands of government of agencies which failed in this instance absolutely. so you're asking something that is completely ludicrous it's absolutely irrational and so if you want to have a discussion about my natural rights I'm just not gonna have it with you because you're not a rational actor you're not exercising your brain when you say we need to get rid of all guns and we need the government to protect us because this is a very specific example the government in the Texas shooting the Air Force I eh, just forgot to send the paperwork to the gun registry database, so he was able to buy a gun. In the South Carolina church shooting, he was he was uh, on several different lists for mental health issues, and James Comey came out and said, "Oh yeah, well, sorry, that was our bad. We forgot to put him on the on the gun registry." Time and time again, the government is failing to protect us in these instances. The government is outlawing armed guards in these schools, which is probably the school had a metal detector. <laughs> like the school had a metal detector that didn't stop anything uh, the guard was killed protecting the students but all he had to fight this school shooter was his own body and he was riddled with bullets instead of having a gun that could have ended the situation exactly. and so w what the conversation around all of this is to me very infantile it is very mired in propaganda and false arguments and straw men as opposed to getting to the meat of the subject which is mental health yeah. and if we had a discussion about something that democrats republicans libertarians like there here's the question for you guys because we also we talk about mental health right but part of the problem is that if you make a mental health database i take ssris I might be on the database. I might not be able to get a gun. Oh, I'm sorry, what's an SSRI? Uh, like a Lexapro, a Paxil, um, a Wellbutrin, a, 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 not, you know, like a, basically a drug that helps cure anxiety and depression. I'm perf I'm, nobody respects guns more than I, to the point that I don't think that I should touch one because I don't know what I'm doing with it. 
you know, somebody teaches me how to deal with it, I will. I would, but I respect the power so much that I've never actually fired a gun, right? That's somebody that you think, oh, well, that person is an intelligent person and respects the power of this weapon. They should have a gun. No, they've taken Lexapro for 15 years. So that's – and then you look at the, the terrorist watch list, the no-fly list. You have, you know, people from Viet Vietnam. There's like two names, <laughs> two last names from Vietnam. And so you have these mix-ups mix all the time. These government lists are always inaccurate. So – so just saying we need to put people on a list, that doesn't necessarily work. And we talk about mental Plus, health. Plus, you don't even know if, you, like, for example, if this kid, was, if he was not diagnosed as being autistic, right? then he walks into a gun shop and they do a background check and say, oh, well, there's a mental health red flag on your record. They wouldn't have been able to tell that if he actually wasn't flagged as having a mental health issue. Right. So right. it's like. Pretty good chance he spent 12 years in government schools and they never worked that one out either. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're, you're basically implying that everybody who has a mental health issue is never going to get through the crime because they've all been identified and they haven't. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that you, that you, that you talked about whenever you, um, you were talking about your SSRIs, that I, I don't think that that uh, stems just with mental health issues. So much as uh, that stems from general education and uh, and and intelligence in and of itself, right? Because it because you are aware, like I I don't know what to do with a with this firearm, and I don't think that I should touch one, right? Uh, because it because it is it, it is a big deal. Any any person, um, any any human being, and this is me speaking from a, a man's perspective, which. Uh, um, that that brings up a, a a totally different wide range of, of of topics and variables that we could get into. Right. But any time that I've ever that I've fired my own firearms, that I've gone to one of the Ball Song of Liberty co-hosts, Cade Coger's house, and fired his AR-15 and his AK-47 that he has customized to the extreme. It's it's a euphoric experience. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's this it's a feeling of of power. That I am, that this is an incredibly powerful machine, this incredibly powerful tool that I have in my hands, and I am destroying an object from a hundred yards away. Mm -hmm. Like that's and that's a really cool feeling. Like it's it's awesome. Right. But is it does take a lot of responsibility to know and educate yourself what what I, I am supposed to do whenever it comes to handling this tool. Right. And the, and further background checks. The background check system isn't working as is. These yeah, these last few fix that. these la I mean we're so all the solutions as was so often with the left their solutions just don't work, and so, so what are right. what it's are the solutions? Do something caucus. That's why right like the do something like even uh, Obama tweeted I think um, that it's time for Congress to take legislative action, and it's like this is a problem in general is that. The specific policies as to what would prevent this are never mentioned. It's always right. you ha we need to, we need to take action. Congress needs to pass something. They need to do this. They need to do that. Like you don't ever know what they actually want to do. People just think that if we passed a law, it would suddenly start working. I mean, we have tons of laws to prevent gun violence on the books. It's not like the it's you know free market for guns. And we, they've been on the law. They've been on the books for almost a hundred years now. And these problems still happen. It's it's not a simple issue. It's not a matter of just passing one more piece of paper and all of a sudden we're going to be in a gun-free paradise. And I want to apologize to our Facebook Live viewers. I've got to switch the audio source to plug in the power or else we're going to lose the stream. So you're going to hear a different audio feed. Uh, so so what we, what, what, one thing that, we've, that, that we can do has been abandon a policy change. Uh, Newcastle, Indiana is the hometown of Ball Saga Liberty. And we had a, a, a facility that was a state mental hospital. So they dealt with epileptics, and then they dealt with just men people that needed mental assistance. That closed 20 years ago, and it was replaced. That ground was replaced with a, with a prison that eventually went from being a state prison to just a for-profit uh, operated by GEO. Right. Uh, so that's the, pol the public policy shift we've had is we've gone from treatment centers to just prisons and locking people up. And the people, when they get released, they don't have treatment. They don't get improvement. And... That if we want to try to do something, that's the direction we need to look at, is actually making improvements with state hospitals and the men mental facilities. Yeah. And I know the state of Indiana has made some strides, but it's the, 
you know, we could do more. That's probably the area that we need to uh, to shift. In our, right. In I our would approach. say a specific policy change that could work that is not sellable at all in any way, shape, or form on the national level is uh, to get rid of the gun-free zone designation. Um, this status was created, I, I'm assuming, by people who want to, you know, feel like they're doing the best they can to prevent guns from getting into places around children and such, and. And it sounds, it's, again, it's a superficial, sounds good, and it's counter, you would think it'd be counterintuitive um, to say that we need to get rid of it. But, I mean, frankly, like you said, you know, the guard even couldn't even fire a weapon at this man. And, and yeah, it, 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 it would be a significant change for something like a student, like a teacher or administrator to be able to be armed at a school. Um, but it's something that, you know, I think it's just a necessary step, um, because you're not going to be able to get all of the mentally ill. You're not yeah, going to be able to find, you're not in it. And maybe somebody isn't even mentally ill. Maybe they're just, just evil and they just want to kill kids and, and, and they show up at a school. Well, that's and, part of the problem is that we live in a society where we think we should just, because we have given over so much of our our power and so many of our rights and so much of our. Somebody had a, a great tweet that I'll that I'll find here in uh, just a moment. But we expect to come home at the end of the day safe, and we've lost sight of the fact that the world is a, a place of chaos. And is, sometimes you're not guaranteed to come home at the end of the day safe. It's dangerous business walking out your front door, and right. you have to you have to be able to deal with that, and. And I think the fact that that just exists and there's no there's no law that can ever be passed to correct the human heart or fix uh, an erratic human brain yeah. like his, it's very disturbing to us. And so we want the government to do something when in reality the do something crowd in this situation is offering solutions that are not solutions at all. Yeah, you cannot legislate the evil that is capable of manifesting itself within the human Right, and, right. And, and, and critics would like to say, well, there's a, there's a balance, there's a continuum between liberty and security, and, you know, your freedom to do all this kind of stuff, shouldn't, we should be able to at least try, and the government's job is to protect us for crime, like, that, that's, that's like, it's a fundamental job, so let's give it them the authority to do this, and, and I think that the, the idea that there is a continuum between liberty and security is wrong. Um, the reason that we assume this is because we think that the government is the only entity that can make us secure. Um, frankly, if I have, if I'm walking down the road and I am decked out with, you know, a, a, a side pistol, an ankle pistol, and, you know, a, an AR-15 strapped around my, my chest, you know, I'm not probably going to make any friends, but I guarantee you that I'm probably not going to be fired at. Now, there's always randomness, but the fact is, is that I'm pretty secure in that situation, and I'm also very free at the same time, so I'm not. I'm not arguing that everybody should go out and you know buy an AR-15 and walk down the road with it strapped around your chest. What I am saying is that we have to have a culture change where people take the responsibility of their own security into their hands and not trying to place it onto other entities, because they're not going to be successful at it. They've got their hands full trying to screw us over in other ways that they can't. They don't have time to make sure that you're going to be safe in every single minute of the day, and it's it is it is. It's just common sense. Like we would talk about common sense reactions to gun violence. Common sense is to make sure that you are protected by your own actions and your own choices. And and there's a hypothetical that I think is worth noting. Is let's say that instead of preventing, and let's say instead of confiscating all weapons, um, the government actually forced every person in America to buy a handgun or to have a handgun. They they gave every person in the United States that was above 18 or above 21 a handgun. And when you got that handgun, you could do whatever you wanted. You could sell it, you could melt it down and get rid of it because you hate guns, whatever. But let's say that even if, say, 50% of the United States, they kept that firearm, and estimates say that 50% didn't give it away, you're walking down the street. How likely is it that you think that somebody is going to, that knows that that 50% of the country has a firearm, you think they're going to think twice about maybe trying to mug you? If they think there's a 50-50 chance that you're armed, I mean, as Ryan Baker calls this, the Oprah plan, you get a gun and you get a gun. <laughs> I mean, th again, it's just a hypothetical. But my, my point is, is that we talk about this issue as if the solution is obvious 
it's apparent and that there's just a a crowd of people, a small minority of people who are standing in the way of s- obvious solutions that will fix the problem for good. And that's that's just not the case. There's there are so many levels and nuances to this that are just there there it's it's a hard problem. It's a bad problem. Right. But it's a hard problem to fix and frankly, personally, I don't think you're ever going to be able to fix it. I don't think there's ever going to be a time where you can go to a place that has been violence free your entire life and it, be absolutely certain that you're not going to get shot or you're not going to get stabbed or whatever. I mean, that is just – that's a utopian fantasy. Yeah. And it and really, really is. And that just doesn't make a good political argument. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, so one one final question before we let the Boss Hog guys go because they have a long, far, far long drive back to Henry County. Uh you Forty-five would, minutes in good traffic, sir. N- sure, but it was it was short when I have to go to New- Newcastle. But it's a long drive when you have to go home. We're going against the wind. Uh, but I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, so, you know, the idea of to fix to to prevent the mental health issue. You were all about limiting government, and we're all about less, more privacy, right? What? I was thinking about this today because you have a situation where a mother is – she's adopted this kid. He's clearly disturbed. His social media is nothing but weapons. He, she's calling the police to get help. He's been reported to the FBI, and they've done nothing. The police have done nothing. The school has done nothing. She's at her wit's end, you know. and then she passes away. But how far – so when, when we – cry we need more mental health not discuss guns how far are we willing to go to have government intervention in the life of a person now it's easy in hindsight to say this person should have been locked up in the crazy bin right you're absolutely going to have the people that are going to stand there and advocate that you're taking somebody out of their society and you can say that they're productive and and all of a sudden you're stuck in jail without your fourth amendment rights your first amendment rights you right. got your 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 essentially imprisoned without a trial because they find you mentally uh, unstable. Uh, unstable. That's the, there, there is no perfect answer here yeah, at I, all. Yeah, I, I basically was going to say the same thing. We talked about, you know, the reduction uh, that we saw in Indiana, especially with the mental health facilities right. and the blowback that that's had. And I think that that, that was nationwide, really. But, uh, Indiana, you know, that, that was cutting uh, – what happened there was cutting a lot of the funding right. uh, from the government. And, uh, you know, there's – Speaking from a libertarian's per- perspective, I I don't have an answer for that. In the so mid- it's the heart. It's not it's not legislation. It's issues of the heart, and that's but, what we got to work through. And that's that's the, the, the if if you're a bi- believer in the Bible, <laughs> the uh, son of the first two people killed yep. the other son of the first two people. I mean violence. We are living in the safest time in all of human history. Which is an important thing to note. Right. That is something that we, we lose track of this in the sensationalized era that we live in, that you are literally the safest – it is the safest time in the history of mankind. Yeah. We just Gun have this a- ability been... to communicate instantaneously yeah. and put the pictures. Just like the Vietnam War was the first war that people actually saw in real right. time where you saw things that day. Now we we live in a world of Periscope and Facebook Live right. and in drones where you, there is no spot that we can't record, cover, and get out within an hour. Yeah, right. and so, I don't I don't want to sound like a tool, but you you brought up Cain and Abel, and I've been listening to the Jordan Peterson biblical talks, and that that is just so much like that that is so much of it um, with the chaos and order of human sure. society and and the way that the human mind works that. It's so prevalent. It's never been more prevalent uh, as we as technology moves along, and we can actually observe the way that other people to, react. to go to Jordan Peterson's theory of order and chaos and why we order society the way that we do. You know, to live in a society as social creatures, you don't have the brain power or the ability to understand every aspect of society. You don't have the you don't have even the need anymore to understand how every part of your right. life works. You have outsourced certain parts of your life to other people. Your brain to focus on – because we're not multitaskers. We're unitaskers in our brains. So to focus on the task, you know, for me, it's, it's media, right? So I do media work, and that's what I do, but I don't know how banking works. I have right. outsourced that to another entity. And we have outsourced security to another entity. 
and they're not doing their job. And so we go, there's chaos here. Something's not working. This isn't right. You need to fix this. And yeah. so we ask for solutions. But the problem is that the solutions that people are talking about on both sides just are not the ones that are that right. are correct. They don't they don't make sense. And and uh, it's because no one knows what to do. Right. Yeah. Just the, that's the frankly the 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 answer. no one knows how to solve this problem. Right. Period. We so and, we just get frustrated and, and we start yelling at each other. Well, and we get we get scared too. I mean, we're animals, and it's our main purpose in our entire lives. All through all through animal kind is is survival. Right. We we must survive. We have to do everything in our power to ensure that we will survive. And whenever something comes along and one man takes out 17 of the, the most vulnerable of our species, is terrifying. Right. And obviously that is a threat to everyone's survival. So we, we make knee-jerk reactions as to what we're supposed to do in that situation. And I, I think that that is a, one of the... One of the most crucial errors that the that both sides are making are the knee jerk reactions because that that is a that is that's a horrible thing to do in my perspective. We just don't even wait for the facts in these situations. Right. It's just like the second it comes across the news wire, it's like I better start defending my positions. I got to defend my beliefs. So yeah. if I don't defend my beliefs, then my ver then their version of order is not something I want in this chaos. Yeah, and, and we all feel that way. Every every person that defends the Second Amendment has felt that way. After every single mass shooting that that uh, that I have at least seen in in my life, we've all everybody that has defended the Second Amendment has been like, oh, I you know, CNN is going to come out and uh, the the people who are on the left are gonna are gonna start talking about taking guns again. You know, well, it's like, not even taking guns. What they've done this time, and they're getting more and more you know sadistic about it is that if you are a member of the NRA, you are personally the one that pulled right. the trigger and killed these children. Right. There is, there is, and it's, I find this, I was thinking about this on the way over, I find it funny that there isn't a sense of collective guilt for gun violence when it, when it comes to, say, a guy robbing a bank and killing people in the bank or uh, a drug deal gone bad and a gang member killing another gang member or something. Like, we don't have this idea of collective guilt when these kinds of things happen, but when it's a school shooting... It's everybody who believes in gun ownership's fault that those yep. kids died. Yeah, which is really gross. Right, and it's, it is, I don't know if it's just because there's just a significant anger. Um, it's unexpected. Like, we expect bank robberies and drug deals to be violent. We've we accepted that school. level of chaos. Right. right, right. But, like, the fact is, is that it's not, it's one person's fault. That guy pulled a trigger by himself. You know, if somebody helped him, then somebody helped him, and they could be they would be accessories to murder. But that doesn't. So far, we don't know of anybody uh, aiding this guy. So that the person to blame is that person, and no one else deserves any blame for this at all. Period. And that's certainly not an excuse to go after other people's lives. Their what they want to do with their lives because somebody that they have no association with probably lives on the other side of the country did something horrendous and that's and that's the the logical flaw there and that's why it immediately comes back to this well we just need to prevent this from happening by getting rid of the incentive like it's like you know you'll prevent the alcoholic from drinking alcohol if you get rid of all the booze and you know maybe that is true maybe it's not but if at least at least yeah, one we day did, we, we did yeah. try that we tried prohibiting booze well, and, and, that, and again you know we talk about prohibiting guns we have drugs that are illegal, and you can still get drugs. Well, that's why the second largest category of gun deaths are part yeah. of the gun uh, part and of like the drug war. If we war. really want to talk about gun violence, then we need to get rid of gang violence. And gang violence is almost one hundred percent directly related to the prohibition of drugs in this country. And then, so, if which, you want to get rid of gun violence, legalize drugs, which fuels violent, uh, which fuels the immigration problem because we send the violent MS thirteen guys back to Guatemala, right, right. and then they drive the good people and into there. And, and after they, you get, they right. bring all their uh, warfare training to for their gun violence over, and they start killing people and putting them in the drywall of the houses in the southern. And then Texas. I don't, I don't think this particular issue is the, dr the war on drugs. It's not. But then a larger side, yes. mass shootings like we're talking about from gun violence in general is that. Well, when these happen, <clears throat> it doesn't fit the box this, and it bothers us. Right. When it, but when this happens, the stats that are thrown out at us are the comparison of gun violence rates in the United States to, say, Europe or Australia or something. For one, 
a lot of times the population difference. Yeah, for one, there's a lot of times those include suicides, which is just that's just bad. Like you can't compare gun violence between countries and, and not account for the fact that suicides have nothing to do with that. So if you you have to remove suicides, and a lot of times the correlation, causation, implication there goes away when you get rid of suicides. Right. Um, and so a lot of people talk about Australia, where they, they, they got rid of all of their guns. They had like 54 million people or 45 million people in that country. They, got, they did a gun buyback program, 1996, and they bought, they got rid of the majority of the guns, and they haven't had a mass shooting since. And, and he's been that to Australia, United... so he's my Australian expert. That's why I looked over at him. He, he visited for a week, so he knows uh, all things Aussie. They, they, they compare that to the United States, and they compare it to all 300 million people in the United States. They don't compare it to similar demographics. And, and this right. is a, a huge problem when it comes to these stats is that they don't do meaningful comparisons. If you want to compare Australia uh, as, like, first, let's break it down. What is the most gun violence that happens in Australia today? Where does it happen? It probably would happen in, say, Sydney or something, right? right? It's probably not happening out in the middle of the desert. Um, so if you compare Sydney to a similar urban location in the United States, I mean, you're probably going to see a similar rate per 100,000 people of violence. I don't know. I don't know the actual numbers. But it's probably going to be more similar than if you look at 300 million people of the United States over, uh, including Chicago and Louisiana and New York and D.C., all that together compared to, say, Australia as an entire country. That's not a meaningful comparison. Yeah. So, so let, let, me, let me stop you there because I know they got to go. Uh, final thoughts. We're going to continue the show, but we're going to say goodbye to the Boss Hog guys because they have a long drive back. So final thoughts from uh, you three. Uh, appreciate you having us on. Uh, folks, if you want more of us, uh, BossHogLiberty.com. Follow us over there. Uh, after these shootings happened, what I did after Vegas, uh, I went and gave blood. I've given uh, – Probably 30 times in my life, I've got track marks on my right arm from giving platelets and, and, for, and, and blood, whole blood donations. Um, just go do that. That's the one thing you can do. We're an emotional society anyway, and you want to feel like you're doing something. This isn't going to be solved legislatively, like I said. Go to the Red Cross. Go to the local blood center and go give blood. Anything, Danny? Yeah, just thanks for the hospitality. I enjoyed my time here, and you uh, did a great job putting everything together. And just everybody be good people. I think if we could put that first and put other people first, we'd be in a way better place. It's not that hard to be a good human. And yep. if everyone could just uh, try to do that, I think we'd be in a lot better place. Dakota? Uh, just wanted to say thank you for having us over here. Thank you for hosting our Robin Miller, Robin Miller episode. I really appreciate sure. that. That was awesome. Um, and then uh, I want to do a little plug real quick that uh, I'm – I have the opportunity to go to the uh, United States Senate candidates uh, for the Republican Party in the state of Indiana. To uh, I have the opportunity to go to their debate on Tuesday, so look for uh, – I'm going to try to get a little bit of audio from there if I can and maybe get some pictures, so be looking that for that on the Boss Hog of Liberty Facebook page. And uh, just uh, once again, thank you, Chris. I, I really appreciate Absolutely. it every time. One final request before you leave. You have the artistic eye. Can you move the clo the camera a little closer so we can get <laughs> so people can get a nice view of uh, of Creighton and I, I can as do we that. continue. Thank you, thank you, boys. Uh, yeah, I think the the comparison issue. People so often are comparing. Uh, oh man, look look. Bring, put it a little that way so I look less fat. Thanks. Uh, no, that. No, what are you doing? No, over here, right here, right there. There you go. This See, there. That's why I wanted Dakota to do it because he has style. You, you tuck in your shirts. No, no, no style. Oh, no. So, all right, That's boys. Nice. We'll see you later. Yeah, the, the whole comparison issue is ludicrous when you're comparing uh, a, these European countries of 5 million people yeah. <laughs> to the American country of 360 million. When we have a Second Amendment, it has been ingrained into our culture for nearly 300 years, uh, maybe longer, of of weapons and self-protection. People, what, what, people it, underestimate how significantly different the culture of Europe is to the United States. Right. Like, we like to to think that they're just like our, our brothers, our neighbors that are exactly like us in pretty much every way. But, I mean, frankly, they're not. Right. Like, we have a, we have a completely different history. Um, the biggest thing that stands out to me is how, you know, as far as, like, free speech over there – like, they don't care at all, really, about free speech. I mean, they want to censor the crap out of anything that they find offensive. Right. I mean, 
that is a significant cultural thing. Like you can't, you're, it's, you're going to be hard pressed to find a significant number of people in the United States relative to the population of this country that support outright censorship of speech. But that is just, that's already the law over there in like every European country. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, and, and that's, but the thing is, it's hard to measure cultural things. Like you can't say, well, how culturally similar are they? Like, you can't really measure that right i mean so they don't really count into it it does matter and and there's a lot of countries that are that have significant gun control policies that have huge homicide rates nevertheless i think uh the numbers of like uh mexico or or central american countries are are are, are big ones and obviously they'll say well those aren't industrialized nations in the same way that like britain is or something and that's true but it does it play into the fact that what you're implying when you say that is that the culture difference matters. Right. And there is a culture difference in the United States. For one, there aren't any countries on the United, in the United, in the world to my knowledge that are such an amalgam amalgamation of totally different disparate groups in the same territorial area. Like most countries in Europe, in the Middle East, in uh Asia, they are pretty much one group one demographic, one historical background. There's obviously overlap. I'm not saying that there's no there, that it's just white people in Britain or something, but it's not nearly to the significant degree that it is in the United States. I mean, that right. was one of our selling points. You know, is that we're such a diverse country and that there's so many disparate groups and they all get along. But like that matters. Like there's so many different levels and nuances to the numbers that of of gun violence in this country that. Are, are just kind of thrown out because it's easier to throw a trend line of countries where you have less gun laws and more gun laws and look at the trend line and right. the gun violence goes up when there's less gun laws. And it's like, it's, it's, if you're not, a, you know, journalists aren't trained statisticians. They, they don't know how to make meaningful comparisons to these things. They do their best, but right. they really don't. And their bias hits them really hard. And, you know, so if, if you're, if you see a, if you see somebody trying to throw at you, you know, comparisons between Britain and the United States with gun violence. I mean, you got to take that with a grain of salt, and you have to look at it at a deeper level. And so often, no one, no one really takes the time to do that because they're actually out with an agenda to make a point. Of course, then, and that's what all of this is. Is oh, that seems like a good argument, but like if you really stop and like think deeper about it, you go, that's actually not really a good argument at all because this is a country that has two thousand years worth of history. And we have 400 years of history, but we have a much more ingrained gun culture. That's why we have more guns in this country than we have people. And that's why you you just you won't be able – like, let's just talk about the fact that these are natural rights. Yeah. Like, I think we need to talk about the fact that, like, I think that libertarians, conservatives, people that believe in natural rights spend way too much time arguing about things that are just rights. And Michael Malice last night was just going hard. Uh, I think he can be a little too snarky, but this time I was glad he was snarky. And he was just like, no, nah, I'm not going to have a discussion about what are my actual rights. They aren't up for debate. Bye. I was yeah. like, it's I'm not, such I a great I point. I don't care about convincing you. I want to restrain you. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And feel free to comment on the Facebook Live. We want to hear your comments uh, and the, uh, your questions what? about this. But, yeah, I think we need to just start saying exactly what Michael Malice said, which is I'm not going to have a discussion with you about what is my right to own a firearm. There is no curtailing that. It just is my right, and you need to get comfortable with that, and you need to educate yourself about gun culture, as I've done. Like, I've, I've told the story. In 2008, I was hired to be the executive director of the Libertarian Party of Indiana. I was a gun control advocate, and I didn't tell people that because I was smart and I needed the extra $2,000 a year and I really wanted the job, but... <laughs> I was absolutely a gun control advocate. I did not grow up around guns. I did not understand guns. I l believed every, you know, trope and cliche that is brought out, you know, back in back when I was in high school it was Jonesboro, Arkansas and Columbine. You know, and so I bought into all that. And then I was forced because of my job to go to gun shows. And I just remember going to my first gun show, the F Indy 1500 gun and knife show and being like initially really shocked and terrified by it because it was AR-15s and pistols and just all these array of guns. And I was just, uh, I, I was really 
uncomfortable for about 15 minutes. And then I started to realize this is the safest place in Indianapolis. <laughs> you know, we're, we're dealing with people who really respect their firearms. They really respect their guns. And over the years, as I kept going to uh, gun shows and spending time around people that were shooting weapons, I saw the care and respect that they had for it. And I became less of a gun control advocate or uh, a gun control believer, I should say, and more of a person who became a gun rights advocate. And I grew in my understanding of my natural rights to now I'm at the point where it's like, no, we're just not even going to have a discussion about it. Like, I'm not going to negotiate with you what is a God-given right, what is a natural right that every human on earth, they have the right to self-protection. They have the right to overthrow tyrannical governments. Right. And, and, and the immediate response to this by people who are not versed on the philosophy and ethic of, of ethics um, is that your rights should not cause me to die. Right. And um, that is, a, that is frankly, it's a bastardization of what we're talking about. No one is talking about you have the right to use a lethal weapon against somebody. Ownership of a lethal weapon does not imply the authority – ethically, morally, of any kind, or the support of in any way, shape, or form of using a, a deadly weapon against another innocent person. Right. Which is what you're implying. You're implying that your right to gun ownership does not mean that I should be, I should fear for my life. And, and like, no one is saying that people should be able to own guns so they can just kill people indiscriminately. Absolutely. That's not what anyone's talking about, and that is just sophistry there, there, if you're trying to make that argument. Yeah, there isn't anybody on the right. There isn't anybody on the libertarian – in the libertarian movement, there isn't a gun control activist that isn't an absolute lunatic that is looking at that going, I'm really glad that happened. And the idea that somehow – gun control advo- or gun rights activists are sitting there encouraging what happened yesterday like they're lusting for it Th- then it just every time if you're a gun control person and you tweet out the NRA caused these deaths we need to t- confiscate guns gun owners bear the responsibility of these deaths you've just sold two more guns and that's what people on the left don't seem to realize is that most of gun the ownership com- shot up after Obama got elected. Most people Huge. don't agree with you, and every time that you trot trot out these ridiculous arguments, people buy more guns. Yeah, because they go, "All right, well, f, f- you, I'm going to go buy more." Right, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's 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 frankly, it's just a significant difference in worldview. Like most of the people who support outright gun confiscation and such. They don't actually have, have – they've probably never been around a firearm a day in their life. Right. Um, I, I think you could probably safely say that about the majority of them. Um, and it's like anything. When you're around people who are actually own, – that own firearms, like, for example, to take it out of the gun ownership and just look at a comparison, let's say that you are vehemently anti-immigrant. They've shown that as people who are significantly opposed to immigration spend more time with immigrants, they become more okay with immigration. Right. And that's 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 the difference here is that people who are who believe who who participate in gun ownership, they they hunt, they they just they're hobbyists and they like collecting them or they're radical, you know, Teotwaki guys and they're you know, building bunkers, like all these kinds of people, they tend to hang out with people like them. Right. And they don't hang out with other people that are opposed to gun ownership. And then gun ownership opposers don't hang out with people who support gun ownership. They stay in their respective groups and they just echo, you know, echo chamber each other. And, and then they go out on social media and they make themselves look like assholes because they're arguing with each other. They're basically arguing with brick walls. Like there is no way, shape, or form in any universe where anyone on Twitter is going to convince like Chelsea Handler or somebody that it should be okay for for random uh, normal people to own firearms privately. You're not going to convince that woman. And she's not going to convince me that we should confiscate guns. And you know, you're just getting into these Twitter wars and then you know, in, like in 2 weeks no one's going to care. Like, yeah. I mean, that's that's also what happens with all this. Like, it's and, not even been six months since Vegas. Yeah, no one, I mean, then it's not going to matter because some, you know, the Mueller investigation is going to turn something up and CNN's going to go, oh, look, and this, and then we're done talking about it. Yep. 
Uh, let's talk about the mental health angle because I, I really think that this is something that gets lost every time, and I think it's starting to carve out a piece of the discussion when this happens because, you know, I remember when – I don't know how old you were when, when Columbine and Jonesboro, uh, Arkansas happened, I mean, in the 97, 98 – I mean, I was in high, I was in middle school when school shootings really started to take off. The one in the in Kentucky, Jonesboro was the first one that I really remember, and it was like, oh, I may not be safe at school, you know. And then Columbine happened, and that just really like caught America's attention, and that's when people started to get concerned about it. And then it just started happening over and over, and then everybody in the early 2000s, late 90s was like, what is going on? This has never happened before. Uh, and so everybody immediately ran to guns and, you know, these troubled teens are listening to Eminem and Marilyn Manson and they're playing with guns and, you yeah, they know, went after Marilyn Manson hard, and, hard and doom because it was in doom. Yeah. And video games. But now I think we've become more sophisticated. And when you look at the Aurora shooter, you look at Sandy Hook, you look at this kid, you look at the South Carolina and the Texas shooting, like you see the mental illness in it. You see these troubled young men who have serious issues and people around them know that they have problems and can't really do anything about it. And what grieves me is that there is some mother or father out there who is watching this shooting and watching CNN right now, knowing that that is their kid, that their kid has that capacity like my, you know, every parent, well, my my kid could be a school shooter. But then there's parents who are like, my kid's that kid, and I don't know what to do. And nobody's talking about it. He could go out and buy a gun because he's 18, and I can't stop him. I have no power. I'm calling the cops. I'm talking to therapists. I'm talking to the school. Nobody can do anything for me. Because if you listen to our episodes of The Cost, you hear time and time again, preventive action is never anything that the government is good at. It is always retroactively investigating, suing, covering up, you know, or present day incarceration or law enforcement. But it's never any government is not good at prevention of any kind. And I I feel for the parent that is watching all of this conversation going, well, gun control doesn't help me. My kid needs mental health access. I need him not to be. You know, Where there is a will, there is a way. And that's what really, I think, needs to be the main discussion. And we can talk about guns as the B discussion instead of it being flip-flopped right now. Because the idea that we're going to confiscate all guns, because, yeah, okay, we relent on AR-15s. Well, then it's just going to go to rifles, and then it's going to go to pistols. And then, you know, like it's, it's never, it's never going to stop, and we're going to do this I mean, for the rest gonna, of our lives. And besides, all they're going to do if they give them no AR 15s, like all that's happening is that people are going to have the same kind of gun. It's just going to have, it's going to have no modular exactly. stuff. Exactly. It's because people think that AR 15s are different right. when they're not. Our, the electricity here is really weird. It keeps going it's in. Like and you got a clapper. <laughs> I know, I don't. I don't know. But. The the mental health discussion is a much quicker one. We can sit here and argue about guns like we have for 15 years, 20 years, really f- forever. And you you might get one win on more background checks. But here's the dirty little secret about all this. It's the Democrats in red states like Joe Donnelly, Joe Manchin. Those are the guys who actually block any progress at the federal level. Like Republicans and NRA congressmen get blamed, but it's the NRA Democrats those are the guys who actually stop any of the progress for the Democratic arguments. Yeah, but they blame Bernie Republicans. Sanders himself was a huge gun rights supporter right. up until he ran for president. So you because Vermont. So yeah, the 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 easy, not the easy, but the more the quicker way, the more bipartisan way, the less controversial way, the argument that nobody's going to argue about are. Let's start destigmatizing mental health. You know, I think by the fact that there, b- by I think that mental health has has been kind of uh, like you see a lot of memes about depression and anxiety, and I think that is the people who want help it, their effed up way of asking for help. <laughs> like I really hate that people like kind of make a meme out of their own mental illness and their anxiety and depression. And I say this as somebody who has 
spent the majority of their life suicidal and, well, you know, anxious and all that, and who has really learned through the power of self-esteem and building my self-esteem to become uh, a person that is not anxious, that is not depressed, and is thriving. Um, but I had to wallow in my, my own mess for a long time because I didn't know how to ask for help. And I think that there are a lot of men especially, and men men are not women. And women, you need to understand men, male culture is violence. Yeah. Like that is how all men. All these school shooters are dudes. They're all dudes. And what we've been talking about lately, like the Jordan Peterson episode that we did where we talked about, you know, helping men and men are in trouble. This is part of that. This is the far extreme end of those guys acting out. And there's no avenues, be it private, public, culturally, where, where there's an obvious way to get help. Like there's Planned Parenthood for sexual issues, right? And for women, there's, you know, you go to your doctor, your general practitioner, most of them don't really know what to do. So they just throw SSRIs at you. And insurance isn't necessarily good with covering mental health issues and therapy, which is part of the discussion. I don't know the answer at this point. Uh, somebody literally in the chat said, uh, posted, there's a way to stop mass shootings and you won't like it. Um, I don't I don't have time to read this, but uh, you should check it out in the links in the I'll put it in the show links after I read it. Make sure it's good. But uh, there's there's just no easy answer here. But people who work in the mental health field, I would love for them to have more of a platform to start carving out some of these solutions. And I would love for CNN and Fox News and local news to stop giving airtime to gun rights and gun control advocates and start giving it to mental health professionals. Maybe that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think I think an immediate thing that could be done that would probably be help with prevention is um, to take a less reactionary approach towards guns on campuses of any type of school and let it at the very least let trained teachers or trained administrators or trained police officers, you know, whatever, let them carry firearms. Right. You don't have to let kids. You don't have – you could, you know, like I said, training. Like they, they can't put it in their desk and then go out to, you know, for lunch or something and then let some kid come in and grab, a, grab it out of the desk. Like these need to be trained individuals, but it gives – it increases the opportunity for preventing school shootings from happening at all. Right. Somebody can walk up, whether they were identified as mentally unstable or not, they can walk up and then a teacher sees him walking in with an AR-15, puts him down. And, it, and it, that's macabre, and it sounds like we shouldn't be having – like we this shouldn't happen at our schools. We don't want this kind of stuff to happen in our schools. We don't want our schools to be a war zone. But this is the reality of the situation. If you are if you are if you're carrying a firearm and you walk into a building full of people in do rooms with one way out and that's the way you came in and they have nothing and they have no way of defending themselves, you're going to shoot fish in a barrel. Yeah. That's why they target these to a large extent. I don't know the motivations of this particular guy, uh, but one of the reasons that these places are targeted is because it's an easy it, they they can get as much as done as they can with, until the cops get there and then they get killed by cop death by suicide of cop. Right. Like, the, the but this is a solution I think that could affect things in a positive direction. It wouldn't cause you know shootouts at OK Corral. It would be I think a significant step forward at preventing these random acts of violence from being more deadly. Because like we said at the beginning of the episode, the number of school shootings that happen in this country is down or no i'm sorry it's the same as it has been in the past it's not going up it, it would be nice if it's going down gun violence in general is going down just like all violence is as it has been since 1993 but gun violence mass shootings are they flatline but they are getting deadlier so the number of them happening hasn't changed but they are getting deadlier we could maybe make a dent in that deadlier part if we gave people on these campuses that 
want to actually prevent, want to you know protect these kids a chance to actually do some good if somebody comes in and with the intent to kill because it's going to take like like the, every time this happens it takes a minute before cops get there and in that minute 17 kids can die yeah and the, I'll include this in the show links at WeAreLibertarians.com, but there's a school in Texas, uh, church school, that basically is all, all the teachers, not all the teachers, but security is armed, teachers are armed, the principal is armed, and they have special drills once a month on school shooting activities. And it's just a deterrent, and it looks like you know kids are lo- taught self-defense. Uh, and so I'll include that because it was really interesting to watch. Vice did it. Um, Clark, if you can explain tiered permitting, I'd appreciate that, uh, and I'll bring that up. But the, you know, you t- you take standards of of here's here's what you should look for, or processes sort similar to what cops do with DUIs before breathalyzers. You know, you could recognize a drunk person this way. I think a kid who can go kill seventeen kids and then go have a coke at a subway is probably exhibiting certain signs <laughs> before he you know a firearm is purchased I mean, and it's not going to be 100 percent foolproof but if you can arm schools and gun sellers with a certain set of protocols that might be an interesting solution that might have some effect because i guarantee the the people that sold him this are just absolutely it's gut wrenching for right. the people that sold him this weapon, and I'm sure if they had some tools, I think it would from also, mental health professionals, they would they would have they would have been something's not right here. I'm sorry, I can't sell you. A I weapon. would also I think uh, it may not have mattered in this specific case, but you know you don't need a law to make gun sellers take an extra hard look at who's purchasing guns. Absolutely, there's no requirement that they sell a gun to somebody who's who's asking right. for it. Or if there is, then that needs to change. Yeah, um, there, there is. I mean, I can't imagine that exists. So, like, you know, gun owners in or gun sellers in this country, you know, there is. You could argue that there is a responsibility on their part to be extra vigilant about who's purchasing weapons. Absolutely. From them. I mean, they don't. They shouldn't just say, "Well, you know," and that's a problem with government. This is a, the problem of government intervention in general. It's like, well, I followed the red tape, and that's I did my duty. I, you know, I, right. you know, no, you, you know, you have more responsibility here. Like, yeah, you know, if you see a guy coming in that looks like he's, you know, maybe he's never purchased with you before. Maybe you have some policy where you can't just walk in and buy an AR-15 with unless you're a regular customer or something. You know, these these kinds of policies could exist as gun owners. It just or as gun sellers. That's a culture thing that, that gun sellers can do. On their own, right? And and you don't need a government intervention to do that. Uh, Clark mentioned tiered permitting, like driver's license. You can drive a car, but not a semi. So you get tiered permitting based on experience and training. What do you think of that idea? I mean, um, to me, you know, here's the thing: they talk about the gun hole loop show, uh, the gun show loophole, which w- doesn't exist. Which doesn't exist. A, uh, and you can explain that in a second after I make this point. But it doesn't matter because South Carolina. Florida, this kid, Texas, they didn't go to gun the show. Vegas shooter. They didn't go to a gun show. They went to a local gun shop, right? And they got the weapon legally. I right. mean, they they passed every background check. Right. You know, they were able to get a gun three days after the check cleared. But why is the gun whole show loop? Because you have to get background checks at gun shows, right? Like they they say you can go in there and buy a gun show like you're buying it from a garage sale or something. That's not how it works. You walk right. in there, they they're not just going to sell some rando without going through the same legal checks that a gun seller has to do at a typical gun shop. So when they say gun show loophole, they're talking about something that doesn't exist. Yeah. All right, let's start wrapping up on this. Um, final thoughts, Creighton. I mean, this is this is the world is absurd. A lot of times, things happen that have no meaning, and we want to place meaning upon it. We want to explain things. We want there to be a reason, but the world is absurd. It is cruel. It is relentless. It's going to kill you eventually, right? And you have to you have to be a person who can operate with that understanding, and not let it destroy you. And you can't react irrationally to the fact that there are dangers out there that you can't control. And I'm not saying that nothing can be done by people at large to prevent mass shootings at schools. I think there are steps that can be taken, but it's certainly 
not going to be some overarching federal policy to that's going to target school shootings because we have those. We have policies that on the books that are supposed to prevent people from with malicious intent from getting firearms. It's not like there's a lack of these laws. They they exist. You know, you can't buy automatic weapons. You know, the Brady Bill put background checks for per like the there there are systems in place to prevent these kinds of things from happening. They don't work because right. you're fundamentally you're trying to prevent randomness. I can't stress this enough. The number of school shootings in this country, mass shootings, but also school shootings, is a statistically neg- negligible percentage. You are incredibly safe at schools in this country, right? I- at any school, um, but when they do happen, they're horrible. They're very sensationalized, and they're tragic. And all these kids die, and it's and it's a nightmare. But you can't. You can't try and piggyback off of a tragedy to enact a policy that isn't probably even going to work and at the same time step on the toes or on the rights of individuals who have nothing to do with these with nothing to do with these acts of violence and these statistically neg- negligible things they are by definition random like yeah. you know I would say the only correlation here, and this is, I, I don't know, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but I do think that there's a strong correlation between the fact that gun-free zones are the same as schools, and a lot of these mass shootings happen at schools. Right. I mean, even it, it may sound coy, but you don't see anybody shooting up gun shows. Right. Like, you don't see somebody walking into a police department and killing a bunch of cops. Maybe he kills one or two if that's ever happened, but he's going to get put down pretty quick. Like... These happen, I think, at these gun-free zones because they're fish in a barrel. Right. And, but again, like, no one has an answer to this. Yeah. Nobody does. Neither side. And if they say they do, they're either lying to you or they're lying to themselves or both. Like, they don't, they don't know. No one knows what to do. And that's frankly why it's so frustrating every time it happens is because, you know, we want there to be meaning behind it. We want there to be, like, there is a specific cause that we can prevent with this specific action, if, if and we it's give, not like that. If we give everybody this drug or take all these things or do this thing, then everything will be fixed and this will stop, and it's just it's, it's just not. It, you can, it's like car accidents. You can decrease the amount of car accidents, but you're never going to get rid of car accidents. Even self-driving cars are going to have car accidents. Right. It's the risk that you take on the road. Like You risk, even in England where you have knifings, <laughs> You know, or you have terrorist bombings. Like, it is. It's just, it's very dis, it's very frustrating for humans to realize, like, oh man, not we're powerless not, to an we're, extent. We're powerless to an extent, and the people that we love and these children are, are powerless. And it's just, so how do we prevent it? Confiscating guns is just not a reality. It's, it's like, if, if that were the answer, then you we could entertain that, but like it's just not even possible. It's, it's like not, one, it's, it's like it's, reversing gravity. It's yeah, you just not gonna I mean, happen. Practically, you're not gonna be able to successfully right. do it. Like you're never gonna confiscate all the firearms in this country. I'm just not making. I'm not making a policy argument. I'm making just a reality, a reality based factual statement. Like it's right. just not possible. And 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 the fact is, is that the people who uh, the the people who commit these these mass shootings are very unlikely to be long-term gun owners. And a lot of those 330 million estimated guns are owned by people who've owned guns for, you know, all all their lives, Right. you know? So you're talking about people making kind of spur of the moment. And I want, this kid's probably said he bought it for a year ago or whatever. Um, which means he's probably been entertaining something like this for a year. But like that, that's what I'm talking about is like, this is like it kind of an out of a no, out of nowhere thing. And he, he walks, he, he buys a firearm He's a, he's an adult, and he has this malicious intent that we can't identify. Yeah, and you're not going to be able to get rid of that by confiscating all of the guns of the people who are following the law fine, and they're not killing anybody. Right. You know, and you can put in background checks. I mean, you could just outright not sell guns anymore, but then you're just going to have people who own all these guns selling it to each other. I mean, like there is no easy solution to this. There's no just simple pass the law and it's fixed. And sadly, the next time it happens, I can just replay the show. Because it's going to happen again, and that's the depressing part. So, 
Um, okay. Uh, for my part, I want to read an email, a Facebook message that I got for, from uh, P- Pietor. Um, I am so sorry. He's, he's Polish, <laughs> and so I'm not going to be able to say his name. Uh, he writes, Hi, Chris and team. I want to greet you guys from the land of Poland. Not sure how many Polish listeners you actually have. I think you're it. But I may be one of the longest and most faithful. I just want to say that I greatly enjoy your show. It gives me a lot in terms of getting a grasp of U.S. politics and libertarianism in general. But also, what is even more important to me, I can develop my conversational English. That's thanks to the chat you guys are always having at the beginning of each episode. I love it, and I can pick up a whole lot of useful phrases, intonations. Thank you guys for that. I must also admit that I very much appreciate, dear leader, my attitude toward life, religion, and other people. You are certainly a great gay. He meant great guy. Uh, Working on that English, though. Uh, If you should ever be in Poland, please let me know so we can have a beer or two. I'd love to come to Poland. Oh, and if you need an insight on what's going on here in Poland as far as history, politics, or libertarianish movements are concerned, go ahead and contact me. I remember one of these days in an episode when one of the guys said something about Poland, which was not particularly educated and, well, simply wrong. Cheers, Pietor. Uh, I'm sorry. I meant great guy, not great gay. Uh, so thanks so much, Pietor. It is so cool to have a, a Polish listener, and we thank you so much for being a faithful listener, and we're so glad that we can help you with English. And that's really cool. That's a cool thought that this this conversational podcast where it's a group of friends sitting around talking, we're helping teach people English. I want to say thank you to Brandon Luke, Christy Avery, Jason Doolittle, and Craig DaCosta for being $100 a month subscribers. Uh, being valued members of our community. You can be a valued member of our community by joining our Patreon for five, one, five, ten, twenty-five, or a hundred dollars a month. Uh, that really helps us out a lot. I am able to go to Liberty Con at the beginning of next month and report. I also want to thank Craig DaCosta, Nick. Uh, I don't know if Nick Nick Economopoulos. I'll say his name and apologize later if you didn't want it out there. Christy Avery and Joey Tarner. Thank you guys for contributing via PayPal to help with that trip. I was able to buy um, several dozens dollars worth of, uh, of materials that I, I got on uh, Vistaprint today to go out there and Ooh. bought the plane ticket. Are they embossed? Booked the hotel. Are no, they, no, they're no, not embossed no. in Clamshell and Times New Roman 3. Um, <laughs> But uh, you guys help uh, buy all the materials that I got, the signage and all that good stuff. So we're going to have a presence at SFL Liberty Con. If you are there, please be sure to stop by the table and say hi. Get plenty of video because we need to make sure that he stays on his best behavior. Oh, yeah. If you creep shot me, okay? Uh, But try to make me not look so fat if you can. uh, Creep shot me at good angles. Uh, All right. Creighton. It's been so nice having you here. I hope this isn't goodbye forever. Oh, I doubt it will be. I'm sure that the, some Thursday you'll sporadically message me out of nowhere and be like, hey, you want to do it? And I'll probably be able to do can it. You screech some, can Skype. you screech some economics, please? Yeah, I, I'm sure I'm sure I can Skype in. I did it once, but... We I, didn't yeah. have the technology back then. Yeah, now we do. So, yeah, I mean, this will probably not be the last thing you ever hear from me. Excellent. Well, but I, it won't be as good quality because it'll be through a, a, a computer mic. I'll send you a USB mic. we got podcast money now. I'll send you a nice <laughs> mic. So not like those old 2013 shows when you were in D.C. and it sounded like asshole. You're literally <laughs> broadcasting from a potato. <laughs> so so thank you so much for, for being a part of this, Creighton, and I'm glad that you were here. we got a lot of great... Uh, comments of you being back, and everybody loved having you and Chris reunited and not hit each other. Well, that was that was also good. All right. Thanks <laughs> so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, please go to the Facebook page. We recorded the only the gun portion of the show. I truncated it so we didn't put a lot of the Boss Hog stuff on the Facebook Live. So if you want to share this with your friends and give them a different perspective on the debate that's happening right now, please share this live video with your friends and say, hey, here's a different perspective. You're not getting it on CNN. They're not, you know, trying to push gun rights down your throat, although we kind of are, but we're not trying to do it in, like, the normal way, right? Right. I, yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear where we fall on the gun rights issue. So, I mean, but you kind of get that with the name. Exactly. But I don't. I think we come at it from a different perspective than, you know, we're not trying to be gross. Mike, Mike Mouse or something. Right. Like. Yeah. So I, I think that it's it's hard. It, it, that's that's one of the things that we try and sell ourselves on. It's hard to put us in a box, right? That's so. right. 
think that's... I am, I am. Uh, all right. Thanks so much for joining us here on this episode. That was supposed to be Man of the Box. Yeah, I, I, I caught I that a little else, bit. But... Yeah. <laughs> uh... la, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you next week.